this concept of learning is a cognitive psychology term, but in academia, it's education. And that's why they invented educational psychology, right? Educational psychology goes, all right, I know learning theory, but when and where and how do we apply learning theories in a classroom? When can, can't we apply learning theories in a classroom? Why is this terminology so important? Well, in learning theory, the term that matters is motivation or attention. In educational theory, the term that matters is engagement, right? Because we, we, we define an education and engagement. We don't use the term engagement so much in actual learning theory because students have to have attention to learn, right? But they learn. One of my favorite misnomers, right, is the term lifelong learner. There is not possibly a non-lifelong learner. It's not possible. Humans always learn. They're learning for life. It, it doesn't stop. They don't just sit and learn nothing, right? But lifelongly educated is a different thing, right? That's where you're taking classes in your later years in life. You're, you're interacting in these some sort of focused, planned, educative environment, lifelong education. But everybody's a lifelong learner. We can't like just stop learning, right? Now, so when you look at engagement from a, a behavioral point of view, very little has changed educationally, right? Since the beginning of academia, mostly at set tertiary levels, the biggest problem has been students skipping class. Because if students skip class, they're not engaged. Right? That's the first basic level of engagement. Are you present, right? Now, one of the struggles has always been, okay, if you have a class of 160, how do you get them engaged? Right. So we use base measurement for engagement. Did they have attendance? Did they hand in assignments? Right. Base. Right. Because in 160 students in a class, the average class is 60 minutes for everybody to speak. Someone would have to speak every 30 seconds to be some form of active talking engagement versus a passive sitting engagement. And that becomes another definition that we have to deal with within this term of engagement. Are we talking active passive engagement or um, passive sitting engagement? Because they're both can be engaged. Now the struggle with passive engagement is that struggle when a student looks engaged. And this is where the struggle with some forms of ADHD where someone represents in the previous term of ADD in which they look attentive, but something in their mind stops them from paying attention. So they're not even passively engaged. They're just staring at you. So these terms. Now, I wanted to start just to say, please feel free to ask a couple of questions in the middle to evoke engagement, right? <laughs> to say, share, ask questions, interact, to create an active engagement um, opposed to a passive engagement. Now, these are some terminologies. Uh, talk, kind of talk about how to kind of apply this stuff. And, and when we talk about, uh, I teach at CQ, and in the secondary education program after first year, every class is distance, every single one. There isn't any online, in-person component of the class. So I was teaching distant pre-COVID. And it was a big adjustment for me coming from a previous institution where there was no such thing as uh, sort of, I, I, there wasn't really a, a, a sort of distant form of education. Um, at my institution, I actually invented it on accident when Skype was a thing before Zoom existed, pre-Zoom. Um, I had to travel to California and they needed somebody to teach classes over summer. And I said, I can't do it. They begged me to do it. I said, look, I have tickets to California if we can teach in Skype. And we couldn't see each other, no visual, only Skype. And the engagement there was completely different because people knew they had to talk. Uh, we're in a classroom, they could just be passive. But in the Skype, I said, you have to talk or this won't work. And so all the students had to talk. All that passes come down to this era. I'm in a Zoom world. And for me, the Zoom is worse. Let's look at this room. Yes, I see uh, Katrina is typing sometimes. But in this classroom, non-presenting people, I can only ascertain two people that are engaged, David and Jenny. Everybody else is blank screened. There is no co-engagement between us. 
I can't see faces. David shakes his head every now and then. I now know there's some interaction. I have no way to know if there's any, okay, I got a thumbs up, right? Now that's an engagement, right? I have no way to know if there is engagement. Brent could be making coffee. Katrina could be doing something. You don't, we don't really know what's going on. And this is going to become a distant problem for us to deal with. Um, and all the ways where I, we use psychology, where I've tried to interact with it, like traditionally to create engagement classes, we would change our instruction, we would uh, do things, but you would actually talk to students, ask individual students questions. I started doing that in my institution and then I got complaints because students felt they were embarrassed because I called them out and then I shouldn't call them out, which actually reducing, again, active engagement. This is going to be a struggle that we are all going to have to deal with. Why? Historically, top students have always been very engaged no matter what you do to them, right? If you look at historical education, we were rough and mean to students. Strict, brutal, Socratic method, time times mean, and yet we still had the top students engaged, right? Now, historically in education, in that time period, we didn't care about educating everybody. And there wasn't this social pressure put on academic institutions like there is today. As academia is charging more and more money, they're expecting more and more out of academics. So the world is changing where they're expecting us to generate more engagement at the same time that we're sitting in these institutions in which engagement for what traditionally the middle and lower tier, which has always been the problem, is becoming more and more difficult. Um, we started this and we thought only two people are gonna be here. We thought what a great engagement thing where two people are present. And now it's an engagement thing and I see two people talking. Um, I didn't come to actually propose any answers because to this date, I still struggle. I don't know what the answers are. Every day I'm trying to battle. Uh, every day I'm trying to get my students more engaged, more interactive. The one struggle I have is if the institution very much agrees with you. And that's where a struggle, because that's why it's education and not learning, right? Because if it was learning, they would show up because they wanted to. The reality is they want a degree. They don't have to show up. And so my institution said, well, put as much of the information online so that if they don't show up, right, then they get it anyways. And when you give anybody a counter option to not showing up, they won't show up. That's just human psychology. But I think that's my 10 minutes or my time. Thank you, Ralph. That's very interesting that you put the notions of motivation, learning, and education together to the student engagement. I have a quick question for myself, though. Does student engagement actually ensure student success? From the psychological perspective. I mean, Whether it's nothing ensures anything, right? Because it, it, you're asking a question that has a latent definition. A, a student can be actively engaged in class because of the social component, right? But that doesn't mean they're actively engaged in the unit. I mean, I we've had tons of students that come, talk all the time, go home, just never do the work, right? Because now once they leave the room, there's a whole separate onus of where there's a control on their time. Um, my favorite example was uh, my first year of university. I just wanted to learn as much as I could. I was very engaged, very motivated. So in the summer, I was the tech person setting up for all the classes. And one of the women uh, professors who I got to meet, she taught this class on the psychology of gender. And I said, could I audit the class? I'm the guy that sets up your stuff. Now, I was 100% engaged in every single one of the classrooms. I talked. People thought I was a student. No one knew. She gave me permission to show up every day but I was not engaged in the unit because I wasn't enrolled. I didn't hand in an assignment. No one actually knew I was there. We actually used to sit after class and have long conversations about gender roles. She said I was one of her favorite students, but in actuality, I was never a student, right? So in academia, the definition of engagement is very institutionalized, right? Because I could, at my university, I could never come to a single class, hand in every assignment, get an HD, and never have been engaged in the class, but I was engaged in the unit in that I handed in assignments. Great. Thank you, Robert. Um, I think there are a lot of comments for you to respond later, uh, but there's one very interesting question that I think you would answer very well. 
Um, what do you think? Oh, because we talked about that before, I think. Um, what do you think of cultural differences in the student engagement context? Well, okay, so psych psychologically, engagement is defined the same. Culturally, the way in which that game engagement is enacted is different. Does that make sense? I have actually taught in Japan where there's a social structure that says engagement, our students listen and don't speak out. Um, I had a weird scenario. I didn't mean it. I didn't. I was invited to teach with a teacher in Japan. Her job was to teach English. And she um, said, uh, we could tell that Shakespeare was British because of his dictionary. And I, I raised my hand and I go, I think you mean diction because uh, in dictionary is a book. But diction is the way in which he speaks. No, Robert, dictionary. And, and I, I realized very quickly, you don't ever correct the teacher. That's bad engagement, right? And she got mad at me. After class, she took me and said, why would you correct me in front of students? So I went, oh, I, I was just helping. I'm sorry, right? Like cultural defines the way in which engagement is accepted or unaccepted, liked or not liked, because it's an educational thing, a cultural definition. Well done, thank you, Robert. And uh, feel free to have a look at the comments that people have. And it's a very interesting dynamic, you know, coming from the cultural angle, the psychological angle. And I myself, um, growing up in Borneo, I do have a different definition for engagement, uh, but it changed um, since I moved to New Zealand. And uh, I guess that is kind of in the education context that things can change. Um, so thank you, Robert. Um, next up is Gloria from France, and she is going to talk to us about student engagement from the learning design perspective in a very particular manner. Um, from the notion of being inclusive and interactive. Over to you. You are muted, Gloria. Oh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Lovely. So I'm going to put things here. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for inviting me. Well, que ahora está todo. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you, our colleagues from Ascalite and everyone else who is attending um, and this panel on student engagement in a digital world. Uh, I am Dr. Gloria Gomez and I am a multi-ethnic female designer of color, originally from South Latin America. I live in Otepoti, Dunedin, um, the land of the Naitahu, which is the South Island's um, largest Maori tribe. Aotearoa New Zealand has been my home uh, intermittently for more than 20 years. Um, so a little bit about me first before I engage with you on the topic. Um, I am an applied dis design researcher in overall educational practice, a co-founder at Ocean Browser that develops OV3. I'm also an honorary senior lecturer at the Safe Side Institute, University of Sydney, and Flams Community member. You can learn more about me at gloriagomez.com. Um, since 2012, particularly, um, this slide provides a little bit of about me in terms of design and my expertise. But since 2012, uh, I've been progressing over three and various bridging design prototypes projects. My University of Sydney affiliation contributes to the advancement of online medical education and health education research. Uh, my collaborative research partnerships include a framework to support inclusive design, teaching and product evaluation, and exploring how professionals with severe impairments use technology for work and study. I bring thoughts um, to this conversation from two design perspectives I apply in my work interaction design and socially inclusive design. Interaction design, uh, it's about how, it's defined as how people, for example, teachers relate to other people, for example, students, through the mediating influence of products. Uh, this could be instruction, materials, technologies. And, uh, and in this, per this design perspective, a product can be or could be a physical object, 
and experience uh, activities or services. Uh, this is a new understanding of what a product can or could be. Um, social inclusive design uh, meet needs of people of diverse age and capability in wide range of contexts because uh, appropriate access to information, products, services, and facilities is a human right. Key concepts uh, from the inclusive design approach that I constantly in interrogate and include in my practice and the methods I develop are countering design exclusion, user acceptability attributes, user practical acceptability attributes, types of inclusive designs. It's, okay. A student engagement is not a new topic in higher education. And when this uh, sentence uh, included in the description of the panel, uh, I read it and I reflected upon it, I thought, if I go back to when I was a face-to-face -face higher education student in the 90s, I remember to thrive when a paper was engaging and interesting and struggle to attend or come to class when a paper was not engaging and interesting. When I think about uh, my own experience, perhaps it was all down to how individual teachers set up the pace of teaching and learning, the kinds of activities they suggested we did and how the educational materials were arranged to make this experience meaningful for us. Or other factors where uh, if I felt like I belonged to the classroom, if I got along with my peers, it felt like we could work together on projects, if I liked my teacher and my teachers liked me. Wow. Um, there are so many factors, sociocultural, technological, environmental, that influence student engagement. It is, if it's, if it's difficult face-to-face -face when we are designing for students to relate uh, to teachers or peers through the mediation of materials used and shared in a physical environment, it is even more difficult online. Everything and everyone is distributed, students, teachers, materials, technologies, and when we want when we come together online, the materials and technologies to study might be or might not be well orchestrated. Are we encouraging engagement or disengagement through purposeful or unintentional design? The learner must want to learn is the third condition of mini for meaningful learning according to a, 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 a learning theory. A teacher has indirect influence on these through designing instruction and materials. Is the interaction design of instruction and materials helping to engage with learning? Is the material conceptually clear, presented with examples and relatable to the learner's prior knowledge? To what a learner already knows? Is the new knowledge to be learned relevant to prior knowledge? How a module, a paper, or course, a program, an educational system is designed has the potential to oppress or liberate. A digital technology or visual representations of any kind, intentionally or unintentionally designed, have perceived affordances, signal how a thing or product operates, is for, and also has cultural constraints limit the number of alternatives to interact with a thing of a product. Just think about anything you design for your teaching and learning, and you'll see that these affordances and constraints appear. Any of the following could impact how we engage with students in online study. Do you know who your students are? Where do they come from? main city centers, small towns, rural areas, overseas? Who is studying while working, caring for family? What is their setup for studying? Do they study mainly at the library or at home? What is their computer setup? Do they share computers? Who is studying using smartphones, sharing computers in noisy environments while working or looking after children? How does the internet infrastructure perform where they live? What is the level of university study skills for the paper course you teach or we are teaching? Have we ha have, some, have some of your students declared diversities in cognitive, physical, or socioeconomic capabilities? Can you observe diversities in cognitive, physical, 
or socioeconomic capabilities. We can already implement meaningful engagement with the students through materials and activities. Well-designed materials taking into consideration diverse capabilities and contexts. Lectures are well-structured, understandable. Assessment activities are realistic, can be achieved. There is a lot of information on how to do this well nowadays, in addition to the support that can be provided by institutions. What about if we are designing something good pedagogically, but the TIC is not helping you and you lose student engagement? For example, hybrid courses bringing online and face-to-face -face students together synchronously could be tricky for regional and overseas students using unstable internet connections. Orchestrating interactions between online and face-to-face -face students is becoming an art. Seamless interaction is needed for engagement. If online students can fluently participate in activities with face-to-face -face students and teachers, they are missing out, might feel disconnected, disengaged, and perhaps like they don't belong. What we choose to design for student engagement matters. For studying well within a respectful time frame and study performance. For taking into consideration well-being of everyone, the teachers, the students, support staff. Make work tools can hinder student engagement and study performance and can also make teachers feel exhausted if they take too much time to set up. I have some takeaways, but I am stopping here for some commentaries. Um, if we don't have a chance to do the takeaways, I am making these slides available. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Um, as an academic developer, I do understand the importance of designing a meaningful or, you know, um, pedagogically sound um, learning experience for our students. So one question here, how are we going to evolve that um, learning design in the different, for different cohorts? So if we pre orchestrate it before the semester, how are we going to, can we change it during the class? Because we don't know who are our students. Is that the question for Nui? Um, yes. Yes, I think we need in the, in the ways that we design for our class, of our teaching, I think we ha have to afford for ad adjustments while we are teaching. Also, if we have been teaching a subject for a long time, we kind of know who is coming. Uh, so we can consult with uh, the people in at our institutions that have kind of the demographic of the people that are coming to us. Uh, reach out to your institutions, people and materials and librarians and everyone that you work with to find out who your students are. Uh, and, and use any information that you that you have learned through your own experience and that you have around you to, to kind of preempt this a little bit, but also afford for things to need changing as you go along. Also consult with your students as well, if it's needed. I think that the way that we teach and learn nowadays is so complex, is so dynamic that we cannot do it alone. I think we need a, the support of everyone around us and also the people that we are helping to learn as well. Thank you, Gloria. David, you have your, you have your hands up. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Gloria. Great talk. And thanks to the other speakers as well. It's been really interesting. Um, you had in your slide there that when you have a sort of face-to-face -face group and perhaps an online group, and that can be a challenge. I think we all know that's a challenge when you've got those different sort of formats. Um, but you sort of suggested there's a there can be a limitation with trying to, uh, that the people online might be missing out, for example, on, on opportunities to engage with a face-to-face -face cohort. But I, I, I see maybe in some contexts that not being problematic if you have an, a large enough online contingent and you can create enough collaborative um, opportunities for that for that online group. And I just wanted to kind of put that to you and see how you felt about that. Um, Cause I don't always see that online group being at a disadvantage or a deficit um, depending on obviously the context and how you create that numbers and so on. Do you agree with that? Like, Well, it sounds to me, I'm listening to what you're saying. It seems like you are doing good design. 
And that's what I am trying to say is that the important thing is that if we are orchestrating all these things, make sure that we are attending to what is needed for the people who are incoming online when we want to have this hybrid model, which I think is wonderful. I mean, I, I think it's exciting, you know, sure. but we need to learn how to do it well. And if we feel that we don't know how to do it well, we need to find ways to learn and also to make sure that we do it taking into consideration that it has to do with working hours, you know, not to kill ourselves in the process. I think everything we do, we need to learn to do it, you know, taking into consideration the well-being of ourselves as teachers and also the well-being of everyone else around us. That's actually how good design should be in every area, not only in education. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, your yeah. um, your slide about the, the more holistic aspects of learners' lives beyond just what we yeah. see when they are engaging with us online, whether synchronously or asynchronously, like, you know, those things obviously influence a lot of how they actually orient to the online learning or the environment yeah. or the engagement. So yeah, yes. point taken, yeah. Yeah, thank you, David, for your question, great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gloria. And last but not least, Katria. Um, she's going to talk to us about student engagement um, in various mediums. Um, so what are the different types? Over to you, Katria. You are muted. Sorry, I've got too many screens happening. Um, I've been teaching in blended mode since 2001 and a few years later online. So my practice and my research is around um, online and blended engagement. And um, I just wrote down a few musings, I suppose. So the fact that it's a wicked problem, it's been around for ages, it's really difficult to define. And there are a lot of words and terms that are used interchangeably. And even the other speakers here today have used some of these, such as relationship, presence, participation, active learning. So often those words are used interchangeably with the term engagement. And I think the fact that it has changed significantly since COVID, um, our expectations have changed, students' expectations have changed really goes to the fact that it is malleable, it's not static. And hey, it must be important because governments all over the world measure it. So we've got the NESI, which is the US and Canada Student Experience Survey, the Aussie, which was the precursor to quilt used by New Zealand and Australia, the um, UCS, which is the United Kingdom one, there's an Irish one, a South African one, a Chinese college. So it's all over the place and it's not just a Western concept either. Um, it's actually used everywhere. So um, I, I think that um, one of the comments that someone had a question about, you know, do we know if engagement makes a difference to student outcomes? And we do know that it, it does. It does make a difference. And so not only to their their academic achievement, but also their progression, if they complete um, their degree or not, how they experience their university degree, and even their attitudes towards um, teaching and learning, we know changes. So in about 2017, a few colleagues and I got together and we were really interested in this concept and we couldn't find much information about online engagement. There was lots of information about engagement in K to 12, but not a lot in higher ed and um, also not in um, online. So we developed an online engagement framework. So for us, we see engagement as an ongoing and regular activities and behaviours that involve the learner as well as the teacher. And the whole goal is, of course, to have some sort of learning. So we came up with five different um, elements or... or um, ways that, that students can engage. And social, cognitive and behavioural, most people are familiar with them because they've been around for decades, right? Those concepts are not new. But collaborative and emotional engagement, they, uh, they are new. So if you wanted to, um, wanted to read the full paper, um, if you just type in Redmond and online engagement in Google Scholar, you'll get it. So... Basically, we looked at what are the different elements or types of engagement and what are some of those indicators? What do they look like? 
So social makes sense, right? It's about belonging, trust, community. Cognitive is about thinking. It's the it's the actual activity or the behaviours that people are doing when they're learning. Behavioural doesn't just include discipline learning, but it looks like all academic skills. So metacognition, things that are actually related to learning in life versus learning the discipline that they might be studying. Collaborative engagement is about learning with others and interacting with others. So whether that's peers, faculty members, whether that's being in part of the university chess team or the football team. And it's also particularly important for those degrees where they're vocationally orientated. So teaching, nursing, accounting, um, actually getting introduced to the profession and developing those professional networks um, is, is key or important in that space. So that's it from my perspective. I'm hoping there's some questions. Thank you, Petria. Um, that's very useful um, mechanism uh, for us to know. Um, there's no question, but I suppose there's a comment, um, and I think that can link nicely to what you have to say. You know, we can create the mediums, um, having some tools or framework um, to help student engagement. But Katrina here uh, make a comment. You can lead a student to the learning, but can't make them learning. So I suppose it's similar. We can lead the students to engage, but how how we can't force them to engage? So what's your so one of the other things that we have been, my team's been researching is a concept of nudging, which is actually um, used in advertising, but we use it with our students. So if I go into my learning analytics and I see that certain students haven't been online and at the end of week one, I'll contact them, check that everything's okay, that they actually can access, they know what they're doing. You know, if they haven't looked at the information for assignment one, I send them a nudge, I remind them what's happening, when things are due. And, and this is specific to people who are not engaged. So it's not the stuff that you send out to everybody. It's the stuff that you send to specific people. That does help. We have found in our research, though, that you want to make sure it's a nudge and not a nag. So if you continue to interact with the same students over and over, often that does become a nag, but it gets to the stage where it comes to um, census state. And I say to them, I think you should leave. I think you should drop the course, save your money and not have a fail on your um, academic transcript. Um, so I even nudge them to leave versus have them stay and, and keep the fail. But as you said, can lead a course to water. In the end, they have to do the learning. We can't do it for them. Thank you, Petria. Any last round of questions for all the speakers or any comments? Sorry, I failed to use the digital hand. Um, I have a question for you. Um, is it Petria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, we, in our institution at Victoria University, we're going to looking to bring in a kind of um, activity in the first couple of weeks to, you know, um, use for analytics and, and nudging. Um, any cool suggestions for an activity that we could run online in the first two weeks of a course um, from anyone really? Like, um, you know, which, like I was thinking about this for a particular course, I think obviously you want to contextualize it, but like anything generic that you can think of, which would be a good activity you could run analytics on and then use as a nudge tool or a nudge moment? I, um, I tend to do um, similar things in my face-to-face -face and online in that I will have icebreakers, especially for those first few weeks. Um, and in online, that could be something like, um, show me a photo of where you're studying from or what's yeah. the view from where you study from if they don't want to share their actual environment. And that often gets some really interesting conversations happening um, you know, versus who are you, um, yeah. what are you studying, where do you live type stuff that kind of created, a, I found that that kind of thing has created a very different type of conversation to get people started. And they did, mm. did still tend to say where they were located. So people kind of shared where that was. Now, that's not something that leads to a nudge, but 
The other thing that might lead to a nudge is that you give them an activity that you want them then to share back with everybody else. And if you notice they haven't done the sharing back, that becomes a nudgeable moment. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Claire? Thank you. Um, one more. Um, we have Claire hands up. Uh, my suggestion was I get them, I teach planning, so urban planning, regional planning. Um, so I get them to choose a photograph of a place that means something to them and then they say something about it and that invites other people to go, yeah, yeah, that's my favourite place too or or that's really interesting. Or I say, um, I, you know, teach planning. So does your city have a sound? What would be the soundtrack? You know, what does it smell like? And, you know, you just invite something that's personal, that's quirky. You're giving them permission to sort of share something because once they make, they it's already uncomfortable, but if you go like that and, you, and then you let them, and I, and I reinforce what uh, Diane was saying in the previous Flans thing that I went to. We, you kind of have to not answer. You have to respond to everybody, but don't be the first person to respond. You have to leave them the space to create it. And, you know, sometimes you can, if you've got a good student, it's like, that's a good that's idea. Cool. Can you put that up? And then you get you can prompt the student and then they, they start chatting amongst themselves. Aligned with that, I've done what's your playlist for studying. Yeah. So they share that. They quite like that one as well. And I noticed Katrina talked about Padlet, collaborative work in there. That's um, that's pretty easy also to use that for things like collecting data or, um, you know, what's your... Uh, Partway through the semester, I tend to ask for, you know, three stars and a wish. What are three things that you like about the course and what's one thing that you want me to change? They um, often respond quite well to that as well. Oh, thank you. We do have very engaging audience today. That's great. Um, so I'm just conscious of the time. We have about four minutes left. So... Does um, each speaker would like to sum out um, your your part um, in one or two sentences? We can start with Ralph. I'm happy to start. Um, oh, yeah. So with our online engagement framework, the next thing that we're doing, I've got a doctoral student who's um, testing it for validity and et cetera. So we're doing statistical testing. So we're in the first phase now where we've sent it, not just it as it is, but we've looked at, you know, the Aussie and the Yuki and the Nessie and what have you, and we've looked at all of those engagement series and we've sent that out to people that we've identified as experts in online engagement, either through their practice or their research, and um, they're giving us some feedback on those items. So um, watch this space. I'll be sending out a survey <laughs> next year. Um for students and for staff, because we have done one paper on student perspective of engagement, and it is quite different to staff's perspectives, actually. So, yeah, watch this space. If you see it come out, I'd love you to fill it in. Thank you, Petria. Gloria, Robert, Ralph, who would like to go next? I will go next. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity once again. And the thing that I would like to say is that take your... The, the teaching you design to share with the students, imagine that it is uh, always uh, a rapid, fully functional prototype that it, it always arouses for improvement. And um, perhaps take into consideration the following three things. We need to know who we are designing for from multiple perspectives. We need to design with technology that is supportive of everyone, including yourself, include yourself in the mix. We design for a community of learning, a community of practice, and everyone in the user community has to be addressed in the process and you will be fine. And the last one is that make sure that you design to include most of your students. Find out as much as you can before you are starting your teaching or throughout your teaching. If you don't do it, you cannot do that before. And it, that will help with engagement and with meaningful learning as well. Thanks. Thank you, Gloria. Robert and Raf, who would like to go first? Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, look, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about where we have an initiative which we're uh, running through our community of practice and our learning delivery that's our teaching um we've asked uh well a group of academics 
um, vested in an inquiry about what do we say to our archonga, to our learners ahead of assessment? What do we say to them after assessment? And we are operating at scale and at distance. And so what you say can be um, the vehicle, it can be the content, it can be um, the, um, the tone, it, there's a lot to it. And so with a big range of academic staff operating semi-autonomously across large courses, we've asked them to come together with, uh, with their knowledge about how to engage with students be before and after our learner, um, after assessment. So that's our initiative, which has, I think, um, got a little bit of legs to it. I think we're over to you, Robert. Kwan Nui um, may have dropped out. Oh, yeah, I think Kwan Nui just disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, I can just say we can wrap this up or whatever, because it's 12. It's yep. fine. Uh, we were supposed to give a sentence. Some people gave longer than sentences. So we can just wrap it up for you because we're supposed to be done at 12. Um, All right. Thanks, Robert. So look, I'll speak on behalf of Kong Nui. And oh, well, Kong Nui's made it back. Very good. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to you for the close. Thank you so much, uh, uh, all four speakers. I saw a report that line drop out. And um, yes, um, it has been great um, listening to this conversation um, about mm -hmm. student engagement from various perspectives and various angles. And especially the most important part is, is the collaboration between Flans and Escalite. Once again, thank you to all speakers, um, Ralph, Robert, Katrina, and Gloria. And um, hopefully we can do this again next year. And thank you so much to all the audience. Um, have a nice afternoon. And I can see that it's one minute past 12 or two, depends on where you are. All right. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Dave. Bye.